Persuasive techniques are used by an author or speaker to get the audience to agree with certain ideas or thoughts that they are presenting. Politicians, principals, and parents often employ these to manipulate the listener to agree with their point of view. You have definitely used some of these yourself, perhaps unknowingly, to try to get your way with friends or family members. Speakers and authors will vary these techniques depending on their target audience and the seriousness of the topic. We can use the acronym PERSUADE to remember eight of the most common techniques. These techniques are power of three, emotive language, rhetorical question, say it again, undermine the opposition, anecdote, direct address, and exaggeration. The P stands for power of three, also known as tricolon. It's a form of rhetoric in which three words or phrases that are similar in structure or length or rhythm are used in quick succession and combined to make a single powerful impression. A common example is from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar when he said, Veni, vedi, vici, or something like that, which translates to, I came, I saw, I conquered. Listen to President Eisenhower use it in his speech, A Chance for Peace. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Eisenhower could have gone on listing the many costs of war, but limited them to three examples, emphasizing his point more effectively and in a more memorable way. Years before he became president, Barack Obama used to try Colin in a similar anti-war speech. He said, those are the battles we need to fight. Those are the battles we are willing to join. The battles against ignorance and intolerance, corruption and greed, poverty and despair. Emotive language are words and phrases purposefully used to evoke an emotional reaction from the audience. Different words have connotations. If I said, this is my mum, versus, this is my mother, both words have similar meanings, but you feel differently about the individual based on the words I use. When I say mum, it sounds like we have a close relationship, that she's nurturing and she cares about me. But when I say mother, that makes the relationship sound cold and that she's an authority figure. It's the deliberate choice of strong words and phrases that position the reader or the listener to react emotionally and to agree with the writer's point of view before reason comes into play. Martin Luther King used a lot of picturesque and emotive language in his famous speech. As a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice, it came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. One hundred years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material... The visual imagery is very strong and words like sadly crippled, manacles and change Lonely Island of Poverty helped paint a depressing picture of what life was like for African Americans in the 1960s. A rhetorical question is a question with an implied but unstated answer. It suggests that the answer is self-evident and therefore the audience must agree with it. It can be used to highlight the inconsistencies or sometimes the ridiculousness of the alternative. A question like, would you let your child go hungry? also directly addresses the audience as a way of engaging their agreement. Barack Obama used a series of rhetorical questions to highlight the need for a change in the taxation system. Should we keep tax loopholes for oil companies? Or should we use that money to give small business owners a tax credit when they hire new workers? Because we can't afford to do both. Should we keep tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires? Or should we put teachers back to work so our kids can graduate ready for college and good jobs. Say it again, or repetition, is when the same word, phrase, or idea is used several times for emphasis. 
It's one of the first persuasive techniques you learn when you nag your parents for something in the supermarket. Repetition increases the impact of a main point or key idea and so engages the audience's attention. Winston Churchill used this technique in a speech during World War II. Period of 10 months, this is the lesson. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honour and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Repetition can also produce a more urgent and insistent tone, encouraging the readers to agree. Martin Luther King repeated the phrase, let freedom ring, several times towards the end of his speech. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring. From the curvaceous slopes of California. Undermining the opposition is an attack which makes the audience think badly of the person or group and therefore dismiss their ideas and viewpoints. By belittling or denigrating a person, say calling them selfish or pathetic, the audience is inclined to see them in a negative light and subsequently also see their ideas in a negative light as well. Hillary Clinton, and as you know, she, most people know, she's a world-class liar. Just look at her pathetic email server statement. By labeling Hillary Clinton a liar, Donald Trump insinuates that anything she says is a lie and therefore she cannot be trusted. Or her phony landing in Bosnia. He muddies the water and questions her motives. Rather than attacking the substance of the opponent's argument, undermining the opposition is an effective persuasive technique commonly used by contemporary it's politicians. A total and self-serving lie. An anecdote is a short story or account which gives the argument a human angle that engages the audience. The story can be entertaining and can contextualize complex issues in a way the audience can grasp. By placing the audience in the shoes of another, the audience can feel empathy for the subject and the position. An anecdote positions them to respond emotionally and it rings true, so it positions the reader to take notice and accept the information. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uses this technique to humanize the consequences of the average federal worker during the longest government shutdown in US history. Mr. Obed was born in Yemen and came to the United States when he was eight years old. His childhood dream was to become a pilot and he knew and felt that in the United States all things are possible. By sharing this air traffic controller story, Cortez is able to focus attention on the significant and harmful impact the political stalemate in Washington was causing more than a quarter of a million people. And it is terrifying to think that almost every single air traffic controller in the United States is currently distracted at work because they don't know when their next paycheck is coming. Directly addressing the audience and including them in the speech is a common persuasive technique. It's also referred to as inclusive language. By using words like you, we, us, our, and so on, listeners are positioned to agree with a speaker because it appeals to their desire to belong to the group. It plays on their fears of being left out or regarded as an outsider. John F. Kennedy's speech at Rice University was intended to persuade the American people to support the Apollo space program. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Along with repetition and tricolon, Kennedy uses inclusive language. We measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. By using inclusive language, it assumes everyone in the group shares Kennedy's opinion. All Americans want to go to the moon, not just the Kennedy administration. It's a collective goal. Exaggeration presents an extreme view of a situation for dramatic impact and to provoke strong emotional responses. Hyperbole is an extravagant statement, not meant to be taken literally. We will build a great wall along the southern border. 
The effect exaggeration and hyperbole have on the audience is that it positions the reader to respond emotionally and so are more likely to accept or reject a viewpoint. It can also generate humor to make the audience view the writer or speaker's viewpoint positively. And Mexico will pay for the wall. So those are the eight most common persuasive techniques used and are easy to remember in the acronym PERSUADE. However, there are a handful more worth mentioning. They are expert opinion, facts, jokes, and alliteration. Including the opinion of an expert or an authority figure impresses the audience and can prove a point. Would you rather get hot new music recommendations from a professional DJ or your grandma? Obviously, the DJ knows the current music scene better and their opinion is more persuasive given the fact that they're an expert in what's current. Including an expert's opinion or a quote of theirs reassures the reader that the writer's viewpoint is shared by someone with expert knowledge. It influences the reader to respond positively and agree. In a similar way, facts and statistics are also persuasive as they are rational, scientific proof which can underpin the argument. The speaker's argument seems more convincing because it appears objective and reliable. When the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent, one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. That is immoral. Beware though, facts can be used selectively by omitting evidence on the contrary. We've already announced over 500 reforms and just a fraction of them will save business and citizens more than $10 billion over the next five years. Any kind of humor, be they jokes or wordplay, can endear the speaker or writer to the audience. It's hard not to like someone who makes you laugh, and audiences are more likely to agree with the opinion expressed. Watch Barack Obama have a go at telling a joke. We got rid of one rule from 40 years ago that could have forced some dairy farmers to spend $10,000 a year proving that they could contain a spill because milk was somehow classified as an oil. And with a rule like that, I guess it was worth crying over spilled milk. <laughs> Alliteration is the repetition of a consonant, especially at the start of a new word. Its use gains attention and adds emphasis and can draw attention to key words. While it's not persuasive on its own, it can give an urgent tone. Hillary Clinton has perfected the politics of personal profit and even theft. Perfected the politics of personal profit. Not only does that sound good, but highlights the claim that Clinton is rorting the system and is in politics only for the money. Power of three, emotive language, rhetorical question, say it again, undermine the opposition, anecdote, direct address, exaggeration, expert opinion, facts, jokes, and alliteration are some of the most common persuasive techniques used by speakers and writers. Try including some of them in your own writing or in your speeches. If you found this helpful, consider subscribing for additional videos which will help you read and write better. Thanks for watching.